contemporary transnational conflicts. We hold two major roundtable working group conferences a year, as well as several one-day events uh, relating to the question of how to meet the challenges of abiding by the rule of law in today's national security environment. We also conduct ethics briefings and produce white papers designed to bring awareness of ethics and the rule of law to a broader audience. We work with public servants, members of the armed forces, policymakers, industry leaders, veterans, and veteran support groups, in addition to academics drawn from a variety of disciplines to discuss and make progress on the pressing ethical issues of our day, with a particular focus on national security and democratic governance. I am delighted today to be able to introduce this conference, which focuses on such a critical issue, the issue of the Arctic in a changing environment and climate change relating and, and understanding climate change as a national security concern of the first order. We are joined today by two other organizations, the Annenberg Public Policy Center and the Wilson, Woodrow Wilson Center and its outstanding Polar Institute. Uh, I'm delighted that we've been able to partner with these two other centers. Uh, and I'd like to introduce for you uh, Ambassador David Bolton, who is a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Ambassador Bolton served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oceans and Fisheries in the Department of State, attaining the rank of ambassador in 2006. He coordinated US foreign policy concerning oceans and fisheries, as well as issues relating to the Arctic and Antarctica and oversaw US participation in international organizations dealing with these issues. He functioned as the lead US negotiator on a wide range of agreements and chaired numerous international meetings on this topic. Uh, during the US chairmanship of the Arctic Council, he served as chair of the senior Arctic uh, officials and has also co-chaired Arctic Council task forces that produced the 2011 Arctic Search and Rescue Agreement, as well as the 2013 Arctic Oil Pollution Agreement. I am absolutely delighted to uh, introduce Ambassador Bolton. Thanks very much, Professor Finkelstein, um, for the lovely introduction. I want to thank the University of Pennsylvania, particularly the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law, and also the Annenberg Public Policy Center for this um, partnership we have uh, developed to create this event and to welcome all of you to Circling the Arctic, Security and the Rule of Law in a Changing North. This is an extraordinarily timely event in my view. I have been working on the Arctic for oh, um, almost two decades now. And I could say that during that time, until very recently, the Arctic as a foreign policy matter has been a subject, the subject of a high degree of cooperation, a low, threat low tension region. At the moment, however, uh, the Arctic is facing a number of extraordinary challenges. Um, Professor Finkelstein mentioned uh, one of them, of course, and that it is warming. The Arctic, in fact, is warming on average more, more than twice as fast as the planet as a whole. And that is having profound consequences for the region and the people who live in it and has the potential to have profound consequences for the planet as a whole. Dealing with climate change in the Arctic is difficult under the best of circumstances, but we are not in the best of circumstances for other reasons. Obviously, the pandemic has made progress on issues uh, more difficult. Uh, virtual meetings are not the same in the world of diplomacy as being able to meet face to face. And so the Arctic institutions created over the last few years are struggling to keep pace uh, with the changes and the need for action. In addition, uh, what had been a very cooperative uh, international scene has become less so in recent years. There has been a rise of great power competition spilling over into the Arctic frictions between Russia and the other Arctic states, um, between the US and China as well, spilling over into the Arctic have um, clouded the picture considerably and made progress even harder. I think that's why an event like 
todays and tomorrows and the next days that bring together people interested in the rule of law can help us ground public policy decisions where they need to be. Um, I'm eager to hear what a uh, wide range of experts we've brought together have to say and for the recommendations that might come out of this event. So once again, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the event. I want to thank you again, Professor Finkelstein for this opportunity. And I look forward to listening to everyone. Thank you. Wonder, thank, wonderful, thank you so much, Ambassador Bolton. I'd like now to introduce our moderator for the first session, uh, Alexandra Mize. Uh, she is a senior fellow at the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. Uh, delighted to have her here and to have been working with her. Uh, she is focusing this year on the limits of sovereign power under international law in conflict and public emergency contexts and uh, national security implications of the exercise of sovereign power over strategic resources. Before coming to Penn, Xander spent over a decade in uh, private practice preventing and resolving international disputes. Uh, her work focused on representing and advising sovereign governments and other clients in U.S. courts in treaty-based international arbitrations and public international law disputes, and in designing and implementing rule of law-based legal reforms and human rights best practices. In addition to her work with Searle, she teaches international human rights law at Georgetown University Law Center. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Center on Sustainable Investment um, at Columbia Law School, uh, at Columbia University, and a political partner of the Truman National Security Project. I am delighted to welcome uh, Xander Mize. Thank you so much, Claire, for that lovely introduction and to Ambassador Bolton for his uh, very uh, timely and um, um, inspiring remarks to start our conference today. Um, as Claire said, Cyril, uh, as, a, as an entity, seeks to, to guide policy and decision makers and raise public consciousness on issues vital to ethics and the rule of law that affect national security. Uh, and as Ambassador Bolton noted, um, the, there is perhaps no more vital issue in American and global security today than the effects of climate change. And those effects are being felt acutely in the Arctic region. Uh, so over the course of the next few days in public and closed sessions, we will investigate the intersections of climate change, national security, and Arctic policy. Uh, we are starting today with this conversation as to how Arctic nations can better engage with their neighbors and other partners to advance security interests. This afternoon, uh, we are going to have a panel on climate communications. If we're going to assess and address the threats that climate change presents, we need to understand how to communicate about them. And we hope that that panel is going to help enlighten us on how to do that. Uh, on Saturday, we will wake you up with a breakfast discussion with Senator Angus King, independent of Maine. He's a co-chair of the US Senate's Arctic Caucus and has been heavily involved in Arctic policy matters at the federal level. And on Saturday afternoon, we are going to close our conference with a session on hard and soft law Arctic governance that will be moderated by Ambassador Bolton. Uh, if we're going to address the pressing issues of climate security in the Arctic, we need to understand what governance mechanisms we have in order to do so. Um, and now I must move to a few housekeeping matters regarding today's program. Uh, as was mentioned, this program is going to involve Q&A. Uh, that Q&A will come in the latter uh, portion of the session. You can use the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, if you're on a, a computer, you will see this at the bottom uh, ribbon of your screen. Uh, you can use that to ask your questions. We ask that you please keep them topical, appropriate, and rated PG. Anyone posting inappropriate language or content will be removed. For the lawyers in the room who are taking this for CLE, uh, please remember to fill out your digital evaluation form and include the CLE codes announced throughout today on that form. That form is mandatory to receive CLE credits. There is only one evaluation form per day, so if you're attending multiple sessions today, please include all of the codes on the form. And with that, I will give you the first CLE passcode for today. 
it is taco. There will be a second password given uh, uh, during the course of the session. But once again, I wanted to say the first passcode is taco. Thank you all for tuning in and spending your lunch hour with us. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce the three wonderful panelists we have with us today for this session. Uh, we have uh, General Joseph Fotel, who currently serves as the President and CEO of Business Executives for National Security, also known as BENS, which is a national nonprofit comprised of senior business and industry executives who volunteer their time and expertise to assist the U.S. national security community. General Votel joins Benz and joined Benz uh, earlier this year following a distinguished 39-year military career where he commanded special operations and conventional forces at every level uh, in the U.S. military, last serving as the commander of U.S. Central Command, also known as CENTCOM, where he was responsible for U.S. and coalition military operations in the Middle East, Levant, Central, and South Asia. We also have with us Ms. Sherry Goodman, who is the Secretary General of the International Military Council on Climate and Security and a senior fellow at the Polar Institute of the Wilson Center. She is a former First Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security and staff member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Ms. Goodman has founded, led, or advised nearly a dozen research organizations on environmental and energy matters, national security, and public policy. She is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations and has served on its Arctic Task Force. And we also have with us today uh, Mr. Bjorn Faberberg, uh, who is a senior Swedish Foreign Service officer currently serving as the head of the political section of the Embassy of Sweden to the United States. His previous postings include the head of division for Russia and Central Asia at the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was also the deputy chief of mission of Sweden in Russia and has had succumbance to the Ministry of Defense and the Secretariat of its Defense Commission. Um, so with that, welcome all three of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for what I hope will be a, uh, an animated and interesting discussion. Uh, we're going to start off by uh, having uh, a question from me to each of our panelists. I will then ask some other questions of our panelists collectively, and then we will move on to public Q&A. Uh, so Ms. Goodman, I'm going to put you on the spot first. Um, Earlier this year, you were part of a team through the Center for Climate and Security that produced a comprehensive strategic threat assessment on global climate change. Uh, the subtitle was, How Likely Warming Scenarios Indicate a Catastrophic Security Future. Uh, and so I ask in your opinion, what do you think the biggest threat um, uh, is of, of climate change to our national security? Well, thank, thank you very much, Sander, and thank you to the entire uh, UPenn team. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, uh, let me say, 30 plus years ago, when I was a student at Harvard Law School, um, we weren't focused on these issues. Uh, and to the extent we were focused on the legal issues related to national security, it had to do with arms control and nuclear weapons. So we're going to come back to that probably later in the discussion, because I think there is an important uh, connection to be made. But, you know, in terms of climate change and national security, uh, we have for more than a dozen years with leading generals and admirals that I've, I have worked with since my time 25 years ago in the Pentagon, characterized climate change as a threat multiplier, a threat multiplier to national security, uh, which increases our risks uh, around the world, whether it's uh, sea level rise, increased storm events, uh, wild, rampant wildfires in the Arctic. It's very clear. In the Arctic, the world is, we have a whole new ocean that's opened in our lifetimes. Well, at least in my lifetime. Maybe some of you are a little younger, uh, but you know, I can tell you that back 25 years ago when I was working Arctic issues in the Department of Defense, we were working on helping the Russians build down their nuclear weapons capability 
and safely remove liquid waste streams from decommissioned Russian submarines that had sunk at the Kola Peninsula. Now that was not about climate change, that was about removing waste from the Arctic. Now we see that the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. The permafrost is thawing, creating a very, very complicated, difficult this, uh, implications for the infrastructure, for indigenous, and for our military forces. Um, and uh, at the same time, temperatures are rising faster than the rest of the planet. So clearly we, we see that there is a threat multiplier impact across the globe. We can talk about all, all reaches of the, of the globe today, but I know we're gonna focus primarily on the Arctic. And that's where we see uh, the situation changing very rapidly with a potential um, rush for resources because there are many energy resources throughout the region and it's become more navigable. Uh, and that's created because of climate change a potential, not necessarily, but a potential new era of geostrategic competition, that I think this is where I think you as lawyers have some important skills to bring to bear into how we manage this new era. Um, and uh, there, were, I, I'm looking forward to that, uh, that part of the discussion later on. Okay. Thank you, Xander. Thank you so much. Um, so, so General Votel, um, uh, Sherry just mentioned how in the past, when it came to the Arctic region, there had been security issue, uh, cooperation on issues such as um, missiles and cleanup and things like this. Do you think that Arctic nations' security interests align uh, still when it comes to the Arctic, uh, whether on climate security or on other aspects of, of security in the region? Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Xander. And, and uh, like Sherry said, I'm very glad to be on the panel with both Sherry and Bjorn today and, and glad to support this event here for Searle. Um, before I answer a question, I know some folks are probably wondering why, why is the former CENTCOM commander in charge of the Middle East on a panel for uh, that deals with the Arctic? And uh, it's a great question. It's one I, one I ask myself. But I think the role that I come to today in this is that of a military practitioner in terms of thinking about this. Uh, uh, Sherry talked a little bit about the uh, climate uh, climate impacts in the in the, in the Arctic, uh, but I'm here to tell you it's not limited to the Arctic. Uh, I saw it uh, in very vividly in the area in which I last operated, uh, and whether that was the loss of arable lands or the uh, sig uh, significant water issues or uh, you know, the increase in storm you know, like quantity and quality or the migration movements of people uh, around the area, it certainly is an impact to us. So it's certainly something that military leaders have to take into consideration. And then secondly, this idea of uh, great power competition is, is uh, incredibly important. And I think what we see in the, in the Arctic is we see this area that those of us in the military like to refer to as the gray zone. Um, and while it may not be necessarily an area of direct confrontation, it is an area of, of competition. Uh, where uh, where uh, strategic objectives are uh, competed against uh, by by different uh, different uh, parties trying states trying to gain influence. So that's that's the that's the angle to which I come to this. To your question, I think uh, yes, I think as you look at a number of uh, number of the state the Arctic states, I think if you probably laid out all of their their national interests side by side, you would see some commonalities across this that probably have been pretty. Uh, uh, pretty common for a long period of time, uh, you know, uh, whether it is, you know, protecting their sovereign territory or whether it is, uh, you know, um, preserving, uh, you know, the, the recognized principles and, and rules uh, of the road in these particular areas or whether it is posturing for, um, you know, competition and other things up there. I think these are generally about the same. I think where there are differences, and then, and again, kind of building on Sherry's comments, or actually on the ambassador's comments as he as he talked about uh, in the beginning here, is I think there are areas in which there we are seeing some differences. First and foremost, in our strategic approach to the uh, to preserving our our various interests. And in this area, I'd, you know, I'd contrast, you know, we look at a country like Russia and what they are attempting to do. Uh, they're, uh, it's, it's very apparent to me in the areas in which I've operated and as I've studied this problem, they're, they're trying to usurp a lot of our influence and we should recognize that in places like 
like uh, like your uh, like the Arctic, and where they can gain positional or other advantage in this area, they're going to do it. So their strategic approach, while they may share similar uh, national objectives to us, is is going to be different. And that that's an area where where there is a divergence. Secondly, is in, I think in how we how we address the environmental uh, challenges. Uh, Sherry talked about the climate. Uh, aspects in the Arctic, which uh, I think are, would be alarming to anyone uh, reading this uh, or looking looking at the problem right there. And, and the differences in how we address these challenges, I think, are going to be, again, points of divisiveness for us. And then the third, I think, would be in the management of the resources. Uh, you know, clearly the, the loss of, uh, of significant amounts of uh, ice in the north are exposing a lot more resources that, uh, you know, the Arctic states and others uh, will be very, uh, very keen to get their get get their hands on, uh, and so how that how we how that is managed, how that is pursued, are going to be areas of divergence. So I, I think, yeah, I think if you looked at the interests, they're they're all kind of about the same, but I think where it begins to be different is in how people are approaching it strategically. Thank you so much. Uh, that's actually a perfect segue uh, to Mr. Fagerberg, uh, who can. Uh, talk about the fact that this week, uh, just as yesterday, I think, uh, Sweden announced its new Arctic strategy. And so uh, as a point uh, of, of contrast here, if, if I may, um, if you could share with us one to two highlights of what makes that strategy perhaps unique amongst Arctic nations, or what makes this different from the prior strategy. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you very much for inviting me and letting me, letting me be part of this very, very important, but also very timely um, uh, event. It strikes me when I listen to uh, the introductory statements by, by the ambassador and, and my two colleagues here that, uh, you know, the thinking seems to be very much aligned. When I, when I read through our strategy, which came out exactly, it was published yesterday. Uh, it was sent, uh, sent from the government to the parliament. Um, it is very much along along the lines that have already been been uh, uh, been set out here. So uh, th the reason I think that that w it was it was we need we felt that we needed a new strategy was that the the previous one had been adopted back in, back in uh, in uh, 2011, and things had moved on. I mean, the climate change was was a big thing uh, already nine years ago, but I think one of the things that have happened is that it has really manifested itself in a way, uh, and as was being re referred to, it manifests itself uh, more clearly up in the north than it does in many other places, although it affects and it will affect all parts of the planet. Um, so this in, in, in this new strategy, that is rich, climate change is really, uh, really set out as, as a, the, the main challenge affecting the region. Um, and uh, it, if it has a global effect and uh, I mean, experts I'm sure will dive deeper into this, the ways in which uh, uh, the, the Arctic, the, the effects of, of climate change in the Arctic will also uh, eventually have a stronger global, uh, global effect. But it also affects local populations and particularly indigenous peoples, uh, including in Sweden who see their, uh, you know, their livelihood um, changing. Uh, the other reason, the, the, and the thing that has never been put in, a, in any Swedish Arctic strategy before is exactly what, 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 uh, what, what has, has been um, mentioned already, which is the, the geostrategic uh, importance of the region. And there, I mean, um, it is, it is true that the way in which the region is changing, the way, the fact that uh, new, as, as was said, uh, there is like literally a new ocean, which is to be covered by eyes and it, it's, it's uh, on, on every projection, it will grow. That, that is a fact and that has geostrategic implications of various kinds. Um, but it's also true that a lot of what we Talk of what we mean when we talk about uh, the geostrategic importance and the great power competition going on is actually um, a consequence of something that emerges or has its roots, let's say, elsewhere. I mean, it, it comes down to um, uh, basically uh, to Russia's and China's uh, ambitions and actions. And, and for a country like Sweden, it is, of course, uh, mainly Russia that we keep a very close eye on. Um, and so in a way, this new, uh, let's say, expanded Swedish approach to the Arctic also reflects 
the realization that our neighborhood, that, that our, let's say the, our security neighborhood uh, has changed and it has changed as a result mainly of Russia's actions, the war against Georgia, the invasion of Ukraine, the ongoing uh, war in, in Ukraine. So you have these two uh, main facts being reflected and they are, they are separate, but they interact. Uh, let's say, and I, I mean, I'm happy to sort of come back and dive deeper yes. into, into that. And, but and, yeah, no, and let's and let's do that because there are those. All of you have mentioned this this great power competition, this tension here, and there are those who say um, that while, as the uh, Ambassador Balson pointed out, the Arctic had traditionally been a more uh, tranquil and non-confrontational place, that this is the new conflict playground. This is the new place where we will see. Uh, actual interactions uh, when it comes to use of the sea or uh, geopolitical uh, diplomatic actions uh, in other in other uh, forums. And so um, on that though, I, I pose a question to you, uh, to all of you, uh, of this intersection of the economic development with the security development, uh, well, with the sea lanes in particular, is this a potential for cooperation or is this a potential for tension? And there can be both, but what, um, if, if you could uh, give your opinion as to uh, which is more pressing at the moment. Um, Sherry, I see your mic on. Okay. So I, I think, you know, particularly for Russia, which has long derived a, lar a significant percentage of its GDP, uh, from Arctic activities, the economic opportunity is paramount. Now, the security, the militarization and nuclearization of the Arctic, which has been ongoing over the last five to 10 years, helps to support turning the Northern Sea Route along Russia's long Arctic coastline into a toll road for transport from Asia to Europe. So, that's the economic activity. They're seeking foreign direct investment. China's a big partner in that, um, in investing and enabling, providing the capital and the equipment and, and sometimes the wherewithal for to extract Russian energy resources across the Arctic. So the economic opportunity and Russia's Arctic identity, it's long seen itself as an Arctic nation in ways that the US really has not. Uh, I think are paramount, but the security interests are designed in the first instance to, to support that. And in recognition that the geostrategic equations have changed uh, because of climate change in the Arctic with a more navigable Arctic. Other nations, China, the US, many others now have access potentially to those resources. Um, and it affects how uh, Russia deploys its key weapon systems, its submarines, uh, and its missile defenses across the region, um, as it affects ours in some cases. Um, but, but that, so one should not, it's not a binary choice between, um, look, you know, no conflict and war. I think sometimes people make that mistake. There is a long spectrum of conflict that General Votel knows very well from his special operations experience. No one's expecting armed conflict in the near future, but this gray zone, the increasing pulsing overflights of Russian aircraft closer to uh, NATO, Swedish, US airspace um, is, is concerning. And it, it, it takes us back to the need better to understand, to be able to manage that competition the way we managed it during the Cold War uh, when we had our nuclear forces on high alert was to have a series of confidence building measures and arms control agreements that allowed us to have more transparency. And I hope later on we'll get into how we might think about um, uh, creating such a structure to, man to manage the increasing competition in the region. Thank you. Um, would either of your colleagues like to also comment? 
Yeah, I, I would just uh, I would just really throw my support behind Sherry's comments. There, I think I think that's exactly right. I, I I I think it's hard to you know your question was about you know which takes priority, the economic or the security aspects of this, and I think it's really difficult to um, to make a uh, to make a choice in terms of those. I think they do have to be executed in uh, you know hand in hand with. Uh, um, uh, with each other, and, and in, 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 our, in our history, when we've done that, when the United States, with its allies, has done that, has balanced their economic objectives with their, uh, uh, with their security objectives, that that has almost always resulted in a better, a better approach. And so there, I think we have to look at how we, um, uh, how we, how we do that. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, I, I'm a big believer in kind of the comprehensive approach to, to these types of problems here, economically, militarily, uh, from a security standpoint, uh, informationally, um, et cetera, and making sure that we have a comprehensive approach to this. I think the concern is that if we don't have a, a comprehensive approach in an area like this, where admittedly there's probably not going, there's not going, the chances for open conflict are not very high, we, we could end up dying a strategic uh, death of a thousand cuts here. Um, I mean, think about the normalization, uh, uh, the, you know, the normalization of just what Sherry was saying, you know, increased creeping of flights, uh, normalization of uh, regulation of the routes that go through this area that are not favorable with, uh, with our objectives, yet they become a fact of life because we aren't there to check them. We aren't there to, uh, to challenge them um, through you know, our presence or through the courts or other things like this, I think uh, begins to create a, a situation that uh, does not support or preserve our long-term interests in the area. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, no, I can jump in quickly. I mean, uh, just to, to really highlight, th this is one of the, the sort of core messages of the, the Swedish Arctic strategy uh, to set out that there is it, there is, it's not like an empty space. It is not like there, there is an, a lack of international legal regulation of this area. I mean, there is the UNCLOS, there are all the organs created uh, under the UNCLOS, and there is, uh, I mean, we have a, a whole long list of regulations and, 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 and so on. So that, that is, uh, I think that is an imp important point to uh, emphasize. I think um, there is every reason why everybody, including Russia, should have a lot to gain. I mean, Sherry laid out one of them, which has to do with the, with the fact that they have a lot of their resources up there. Um, I think we have also seen that Russia hasn't, hasn't always acted, let's say, in, in line with what especially outsiders uh, might perceive, you know, for the, what, what ought to be their, their best interest. And they're sometimes a guide, sometimes a security interests, Trump economic interests. So we have to be, and that, that is really the, one of the messages of our strategy. We have to sort of hope, sort of do what we can for the, the best, you know, um, uh, increase cooperation in the Arctic Council, which is uh, functioning very well. One of few international platforms where cooperation with Russia is, is proceeding basically without you know, with very little friction, uh, while at the same time, and that, that goes for Sweden as well, when you look at our, our military, the, the reinforcement of, mili of our military, uh, significant elements of that are happening in the north, northern part of Sweden, uh, because we see, uh, we see the risk, uh, the risks as well as the opportunities. Yeah, so uh, you make a very interesting point, mentioning how the Arctic Council and how this is one of the um, more cooperative international bodies, should we say, but also notably the Arctic Council's mandate does not include security directly. Um, and you also mentioned UNCLOS. So for those who are not aware, UNCLOS is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. This is one of the most widely accepted international conventions on the planet. But dare I say, the United States is not ratified this convention. So we are officially not a party. Uh, we recognize some portions of that convention as being customary international law, but we are not formally a party to it, unlike other Arctic states. Um, and we see this treaty having uh, real implications for uh, interactions with, with other nations. Uh, for example, um, in the South China Sea, uh, there have been a, a few disputes that have come before the tribunal that handles that convention as regards um, uh, use of resources in that area where the maritime boundary is drawn. Um, when we look to the Arctic, all of you have talked about resources there. 
well, as this opens up, there may be access to more resources. And some of those maritime boundaries not having been drawn, this is a potential point of, of issue. Plus, uh, with navigable seas, uh, with military having access to different areas and not, uh, where they're permitted to have their ships and not connects to that. So um, is, uh, well, uh, I recognize that um, uh, UNCLOSE may not be uh, your, your specialty, uh, General, but from a military perspective, what is, if you could comment on maybe what the importance is of having things like that, the legal background of that to military operations for um, helping strengthen those uh, operations in a particular area, having that legal background? Well, yeah, I think, I think um, the, you know, the, the question almost answers itself. It, it just, uh, you know, as, as a senior military commander, you know, we, we are charged not only with, with, uh, with the execution of missions and, uh, you know, uh, uh, but also with uh, with ensuring that the uh, missions are you know the operations we do are done in accordance with our values in accordance with the law and and how the American you know for American military officers how the American people would expect it to be expected to be accomplished and so you know when you when you have the backing of, uh, of a treaty or a uh, of laws I mean this this to me adds a lot of legitimacy to this uh, you know we're, we're we're, you're talking about the UNCLOS, what you know is a treaty thing. I mean, think about the impact of the NATO treaty and what that means to the the, the countries that are parties to and members of NATO, and how how significant that is in binding us together and creating interdependence and uh, and and unity of action. Frankly, in terms of what we're doing, so I, I think these things are incredibly important. We always. It's not, you know, it's not just about what you're doing, it's about how you're doing it. And things like UNCLOS and uh, you know, other, the other rules and, and laws that, that support our operations, are, I think, are incredibly important to the way we do things. Um, so let me, if I could just add yes, on, yes, on that, Sander, you know, there's no question that the, the U.S. should long ago have ratified the Law of the Sea Treaty. Um, presidents uh, from both parties and military leaders uh, for decades now have supported ratifying uh, U.S. ratification of the Law of the Sea Treaty. It's really domestic politics that has held it back, and, and we don't need to spend a lot of time uh, on that. That goes to the status of arms control treaties and the particulars of this agreement. But nonetheless, the U.S. has, for the most part, complied uh, and with the terms of the treaty and will continue to benefit uh, from, from so doing, and I think at the juncture where it actually becomes really critical, the claims you refer to, Xander, you know, take a long time to mature about, and, and they're, they're few and far between the disputed areas um, and borders, which includes one between the U.S. and Canada um, in the Arctic, are not the ones that are really the real source of, the, of any tension right now. Um, it's, it's the seams that exist as um, there's greater access across the Arctic and the existing institutions like the Arctic Council, which in my view have functioned very well on the issues for which they have a mandate. Uh, thanks to leaders like Ambassador Bolton and many others. Um, and, and, their, and their scope has grown to include what I would call sort of confidence building measures by way of the oil spill uh, prevention agreement, the search and rescue agreement, and most recently um, the, the science and research agreement, as well as the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. The area where we, um, where there's a gap now is in, is, in, is in security, is in the military forces. The Coast Guard comes pretty close, but it doesn't include uh, the active duty military force. It doesn't help us yet sort of de-risk and manage um, miscalculations or misunderstandings that could occur. As I sometimes I've said, what keeps me up at night about the Arctic is, you know, a potential um, collision among or uh, a tour ship running aground or an oil spill or a nuclear armed icebreaker, Russian nuclear armed icebreaker, you know, colliding with the vessel it's escorting, resulting in an accident, and there's confusion about who should be doing what. Uh, and there's lack of transparency about who's responsible. And we know that Russia doesn't have the best nuclear safety record, just think back to Chernobyl, 
or the sinking of the cursed submarine. And so uh, those are the things that keep me up at night. It's the accident risk. And then how, what measure should we put in place today to min reduce those risks and manage them should they occur? Thank you for that. And we and I want to remind everyone, we're, our final panel will be on governance mechanisms and we can get more into the nitty gritties of Arctic Council and UNCLOS with, with that panel. But um, but Sherry, you mentioned this, the, the, the chance of accidents, this could be an opportunity for cooperation amongst states. And so in looking then how to build such an agreement, how to um, create a dialogue uh, and a conversation about how to partner to address those risks. Um, you know, uh, what entities or, um, or what means might countries go about doing this? Is this something that, for example, uh, organizations like NATO could be involved in, although, of course, not everyone in the Arctic is a, is a member of NATO, but is there a role for some of these other security-based uh, coalitions that already exist to, to dovetail in um, to these sorts of issues? One of the reasons the gap has grown is because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine back in 2014 and then Crimea, at which point the U.S. and others excluded, uh, from, excluded Russia from participation uh, in the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable and in the Arctic Chiefs of Defense um, Forum. Both of those were military forums at different levels, one at kind of a four-star level, one at more of a one and two-star level but that operated um, in the years prior to that as a way to, to have communication cooperation and come up with some of these procedures. For example, looking at scenarios like those accident risks I just mentioned, which the Arctic Coast Guard Forum also does, but it doesn't bring in the military forces, for example. So I think it's worth looking. I mean, I, we, I, I was part of a, a State Department team a few years ago that uh, with General, Le General Les Lyles, another retired four star, we recommended uh, in this report for the International Security Advisory Board that we re examine uh, the US participation in these forums and then look at other, there are other agreements like Open Skies Agreement, uh, Dangerous Military Activities Agreement. There are historic arms control agreements dating back to the Cold War um, that could be portions of which could be applied to the Arctic. Not all of them cover the Arctic geographically today, or we haven't tried to utilize them for this purpose. It would take some um, interest uh, and priority among the leadership of the key nations to restart any of these mechanisms, but none of it is impossible. It's, it's all possible if it's made a priority. Some optimistic news about Arctic. I, <laughs> this is this is very good to hear, um, General. I think you were about to say something yeah, too. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, you mentioned you, you asked about NATO, and and uh, I mean my my observation here is that I think it, I think it is in NATO's interest, uh, frankly, to to take an organizational approach to to the Arctic. You know, uh, I mean, as, as I think I mentioned a, a couple of comments ago. I mean this. The, the Arctic represents a gray zone um, that uh, that has an impact on European security, and I don't think you and, and security of the North Atlantic uh, uh, organization, um, all the all the states that belong to that. So I think there is a there is a there is a there is a there is an interest in that, and and I do think that NATO can do that. I recognize not all the states, certainly not Russia, but not all the other um, states are members of. Um, of NATO, but we figured out ways of doing that. Uh, you know, it was interesting as, I, as you look at the list of Arctic nations. Um, you know, the, only one of those didn't didn't uh, wasn't fighting ISIS in Syria or Iraq. Uh, so we come together on issues like that uh, fairly fairly readily. And and I'm and I would throw Russia into that, although there is a little bit of a strategic kerfluffle there. I won't, won't get too much into that there, but uh, in, in the Middle East, but uh, but nonetheless, there, so there are things that bring people together over this, and, and we have been able to create mechanisms to um, to do that. The, the other comment that I would just share is the, is the importance of, uh, of uh, communication channels, and, and uh, it, it, uh, Sherry shared several, several examples of things, that, you know, were created during the Cold War, and which helped us, you know, manage risk and, and, uh, and you know, prevent escalation 
manipulation and uh, mis mis uh, misjudgments and other things like that, which are, I think are very, very good. Uh, but we, we don't always have to, it doesn't have to be a sophisticated uh, approach. I mean, sometimes just open communication channels are, are very, 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 very good. Uh, uh, you know, in m most cases, professional militaries, and I'll just talk for a minute. We'll, we'll be able to figure out ways of communicating over that. My, my personal experience or my experience in a place like Syria, again, not the Arctic, but a place where we were operating with Russia um, in common airspace and common land space uh, was that was simple communication mechanisms helped, helped protect everybody uh, in terms of that. And so it doesn't have to be overly, overly uh, complex. It can be very, very simple communication. Uh, it goes a long way to preventing miscalculation. So, thank you for that. Sorry. Bjorn, if you, if you could comment on that, given thank you. That your work with the, with the military, but um, do you, I would add, do you see this as something where it would be bottom up versus top down? Perhaps we promote the communication at the uh, levels of, of military as opposed to waiting for states at a more national level to have communication? Uh, please. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So when somebody says European security, as, as the general did, I, I, I get going and not just because that's what I spent most of my career so far on, but, but also because Sweden, of course, is, as, as some people may be aware, we're taking over the chairmanship of, of uh, I mean, there is actually one organization, well, there is the UN, but there is also the OSC, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in Europe, which is a bit of a misnomer, of course, because it has the US and Canada in as well. Um, and uh, so I'm also a little bit connecting to this, uh, my previous point about it, the fact that it's not like there are no rules. I mean, it may be a gray zone from like, let's say from a military standpoint in terms of what kind of operations might be uh, uh, sort of undertaken by certain actors, but it, it, it is certainly not a gray zone from a legal point of view, from an international uh, law point of view. And uh, I mean, the same what we uh, like to talk about, what we like to call the European security order, the sort of the, the, the complex of, of uh, various, the, the Helsinki final act, the Paris charter and so on. All of these um, all of these agreements are still in force and they still apply to everybody uh, and they apply in the Arctic as well. So, uh, on, I mean, the Swedish view is that, uh, like, you need dialogue. This is obviously uh, an issue that is increasingly uh, important and, you know, worries people to various degrees. So we, we need a dialogue. We have not taken a, a, a firm stand on, on what the format for that dialogue should be. And of course, um, there is a inevitably there is a balancing act. there is a balance that needs to be struck because on the one, on the one hand uh, you need dialogue and the military to military contacts on the other hand you have uh, russia has done what it has and it, it keeps doing what it's doing in ukraine and there there is uh, uh, there is a limit to uh, the kind of normalization that of contacts that we would uh, be willing to go along with uh, in i mean because of that. So uh, th that is obviously one of the balances that have to be, be struck here. But uh, I, we are certainly uh, uh, certainly in favor of, of, of dialogue on security matters in the Arctic. Yeah, wonderful. So if I may pose a hypothetical uh, to you all, uh, and this goes to the, the point of all of you have made, particularly uh, Sherry. Um, Let's say there is an incident, like there have been, um, uh, we hear about them after the fact, and in Russia there was, um, uh, there's been you know, fires on, on nuclear subs, there's been a testing of new um, weapon systems um, that led to uh, an explosion um, in, in Siberia at a testing facility and some concerns about possible radiation poisoning there. Um, as there is more opening, more technological uh, advancement in these regions, more militarization, more equipment there. If there is an incident in one of these places, under the current uh, system and mechanism, how would that be addressed? And it sounds like, Sherry, you're saying this is one of our biggest gaps, but as of now, what would be the way that that would be addressed? Uh, so we did a tabletop exercise last year with Sandia National Labs through the National Academy of Sciences and with the Wilson Center to just to examine just that. Now, let me say that this was done with all American players. So um, we were looking at how the U.S. would respond and, you know, a, a really good uh, tabletop exercise or 
scenario would better be, you know, could, could be expanded to be conducted with the real players. But we looked at this scenario I just mentioned, which is a rush in 2050, perhaps, and it could be earlier, a Russian nuclear icebreaker escorting a Chinese liquid natural gas vessel through the Bering Strait where the U.S. and Russia at its narrowest points are only 30 miles apart by the Little Diomede Islands, um, collides and there's an oil spill rela release and a potential search and rescue. But there's also miscommunication about kind of the status of, let's say, the nuclear reactor aboard the vessel uh, and what kind of releases. And we know that so one, we looked at, uh, and we had a lot of Coast Guard players, and we had some U.S., you know, former U.S. Navy involved, you know, what would be kind of the search, initial search and response, uh, at least on the U.S. side, and would we bring in others, certainly if there were other vessels in the area, any of our allied vessels. We also, since it was done in a research context, we were actually looking also at what kind of observations and science should we be doing over the next decade or more better to understand changing ocean circulation patterns, different rates of sea ice retreat, uh, rising temperatures, and how that would affect, for example, movement of the oil in the, you know, oil in the ice. Um, and so I think those are very useful things to um, uh, examine. I think they need to be done sort of with a broader set of potentially real actors, either starting out in what's sometimes called a track two dialogue, where you don't have the official players, let's say the government to government players, because that's difficult now with U.S. and Russia. But there still are U.S., Russian, and other track two dialogues with people at think tanks like, you know, like us who are former government officials. Uh, and I want to also, I see a question, a couple of questions in the chat here about China. So I'd like to be able to say, can I say a few words about China in the Arctic? Because it's very, sure, very let, yes, China let's get to that. its first Arctic, formal Arctic policy uh, in 2019, declared itself a near Arctic stakeholder um, and has shown ambitions to create a polar silk road uh, where it would utilize Russia's northern sea route uh, to transport goods and potentially and, and bring energy back from ports in Asia, Shanghai, either to ports in Europe, Hamburg, um, and other major uh, and, and other major ports, Rotterdam, for example. And so, uh, and it has takes a long strategic view. Uh, it looks out many years, which sometimes we fail to do in the U.S., and it foresees a future where uh, the, perhaps the polar route, the transpolar route, which um, right now is not a viable shipping route, but since we just had on record the second lowest uh, sea ice minimums, uh, all of which have occurred, in the 14 have occurred in the last 14 years, um, and an ice-free Arctic um, for a certain number of months of, this, of the year can be expected perhaps even in the next one to two decades or earlier. I think, uh, you know, shippers and China with its long-term strategic view are eyeing a future where there's greater access to the transpolar route and potential fishing grounds uh, as, uh, fish, as fish stocks move northward. And that is a huge economic prize uh, for China and for others, uh, for the protein source and for its e economic opportunity. So I think that uh, to answer to answer the the question there, uh, China has Arctic ambitions. They're in the first instance economic, uh, but they want to apply different rules to the global commons they see in the Arctic than they see in the South China Sea, where they're trying to keep the U.S. and others out as they build islands uh, and create uh, their own uh, presence and call it internal waters, where they're claiming it's international waters uh, yeah. in the Arctic. So, so um, General and, and, and Bjorn, do you want to comment on, on China uh, as a possible player here as well? I mean, we have, both, we have talked about Russia, but people tend to think of China first as, as that economic piece because they, of course, are, as even they say, not an Arctic nation, but a near Arctic nation. Uh, but um, one really cannot separate, as we said earlier, the economics from the security. These things are, are intertwined in a way that really can't be separated. So uh, yes, which of you would like to go first? Uh, Bjorn? 
Yeah, may, maybe just to really in a way to echo what Sherry already said. I mean, what, what we what we say in our strategy is that uh, so we, we really we we um, we outline sort of three major trends in, in the security field in the Arctic. One of them is uh, the possible security consequences of the changing uh, climate and the, the melting of ice and so on. And then what I already spoke about, which is the, the military dynamic, with, which is driven by Russia. Um, but yeah, but, but the third trend is, is really the increasing interest by a growing number of non-Arctic states. And, and of course, China is, is first and foremost among those. And, and we highlight that might lead to conflicts of interest uh, and make the observation that while, while China is, is in general uh, expresses support for international right, it does act in a selective manner as, as Sherry was just referring to, uh, especially when it comes down to uh, uh, issues that China considers to be its core interest. And of course, the question is whether anything to do with Arctic is or in the future might sort of be seen by, by China as a core interest. And I, I don't know that, I, that I'm an expert on that, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that, that, that is certainly an observation that we, we, have, we make publicly. Thank you. In general? I, I just think this is a, uh, a well-known well story that we've seen in a variety of other places with China. And uh, we shouldn't be surprised when we see them doing this. I mean, the, it wasn't that long ago when we were reading articles about 247 fishing boats off the coast of Ecuador. Um, Chinese fishing boats off the course. Their, their search for food, the need to take care of their growing population is a significant national security concern for them. And so they will continue to pursue policies like they have in the past through their Belt and Road Initiative that is, uh, that is inevitably going to lead to the North. And, uh, and so we need, to, we, need to, we need to be thinking our way uh, through this. And, uh, and it's not time to be rose-colored glasses with the Chinese. This is their strategy, long-term strategy here that is funded and being executed before our eyes. Yeah. Um, uh, Sherry, you mentioned icebreakers. Uh, there's been some talk about the U.S being behind in some ways on some technology when it comes to the Arctic, because we have so few icebreakers. Um, do we need more? Is the US investing enough in its military tech to get ready for those future um, uh, uh, operations and endeavors there? Um, would anyone like to comment on that um, piece? Sure, let, let me, let's talk about our, our presence in, in the Arctic. It, we the U.S. Uh, military has ample uh, military presence to deter major conflict and major war. There's no doubt about that. Between our submarine forces, our air and space forces, and the Air Force, U.S. Air Force just released its Arctic, its own Arctic strategy, um, and we've increased our capability to deter. For example, the major threat uh, in, in recent years has been um, missile strikes from North Korea, China, Russia, and we've increased our presence uh, to conduct missile defense out of our bases in Alaska. And we've long had that capability. So that, no one should worry about, um, you know, a, a, an attack from a missile or a force or a, some in the, uh, in the Arctic. Now, the challenge really comes to what kind of surface capability do we need? And we do have an icebreaker gap, which we've had. Now, icebreakers are, have traditionally been a Coast Guard capability, and we now have one, you know, the equivalent of one and a half aging icebreakers. In fact, our medium icebreaker, the USS Healy, had a fire aboard last month and had to cancel its mission in the Arctic. Our, the Polar Star, which is the heavy icebreaker that also has a mission in the Antarctic, is also limping along. We are building the next generation of icebreakers right now. We've got three under construction, uh, but they won't be delivered for several years now. Um, and so we're kind of late to the game. Uh, and as a former Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis said, we need to up our game in the Arctic. Uh, and so that means having a better ability to operate uh, surface forces. We took our first carrier up there for an exercise not long ago. So we're resetting our forces to operate uh, in, in the more, in the, as the Arctic melts, it becomes more treacherous to operate at the surface level. But we need presence equals stability, and we have not paid enough attention to that uh, in recent years. We're now in, in a catch-up race to provide the polar security cutters, ice-capable vessels, cold-weather gear, um, 
broadband communications and, and other what we call domain awareness capabilities that we need to have uh, to safely operate uh, at, at the surface and on land, as well as where we already are capable below sea, air and space. So, so this connects with one of our audience questions, uh, which is uh, asking if, if anyone is aware of, of multilateral talks or groups that are focused on the role of emerging technologies in the Arctic. There was specific mentioning of um, robotic uh, icebreakers and how they might shape it. Uh, but is, is this something that there could be uh, regional cooperation on or um, at least some uh, coordination? Of course, there is scientific coordination through the Arctic Council and some other means, but when we start to get into high tech, then we also get into issues of um, IP and who holds the rights to certain things, which is another avenue of tension between the United States and China, but not just the United States. There are other countries, of course, that have this tension too. So would anyone like to uh, address that point? Well, I, I just add uh, that, uh, you know, there's a recent uh, CFR study here a year or two ago that really put a focus on uh, the importance of building telecommunications uh, and energy and other infrastructure up in the up in the Arctic so that we can so that we can handle advanced uh, advanced uh, technologies and emerging technologies and and leverage them uh, fully in, uh, in in this in this particular area. So I, I do think there is uh, certainly opportunity for uh, cooperation with the uh, with uh, with nations that share our interests and uh, for whom we share interests with and uh, and and we certainly we could I think this is a, a, a very important point and, and I think it is also one of the obstacles that kind of gets in the way uh, to moving forward so, you know whether it is IP or whether it's uh, sharing or acquisition processes or other things like this that oftentimes uh, get into in the way we should look at uh, you know security cooperation programs in the in the Arctic, and how do we how do we uh, uh, inter and in, make ourselves more interoperable and more mutually supportive with uh, with the countries that we are allied with? I think it's it's very very important. Uh, Bjorn, do you have uh, anything to add? Well, we were U.S. It's, specific. U.S. is not alone in having some of these struggles, so. No, for sure. I mean, we, we are, uh, we, we, one of the few ways in which Sweden is a superpower is in the field of icebreakers. So uh, uh, that's one thing, of course, uh, because we, we couldn't have access to some of our northern ports without them. Uh, although I, I guess that might be one of the few benefits of, of, of climate change that, that some of the ice, actually, we, we, we are able to rent out our icebreakers for longer periods um, every year. But that's uh, that's meager consolation, of course. Uh, no, I think I mean the Swedish view is that uh, I mean we always under so Sweden is not a member of NATO, um, but we are a very close uh, defense partner, and we very highly value um, our defense cooperation with the U.S., which is which is um, which is uh, close and deep, and 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 we're, we're developing it. And uh, the the transatlantic link is something that our politicians always sort of come back to and and, and under, underscore. So and, and so it just follows from that that, that uh, uh, a robust U.S. capacity uh, to to operate uh, in in what we are now increasingly actually uh, pointing to as as a as a critical um, area for our security as well is is, uh, is to be welcomed. Thank you. Uh, so so it has been mentioned that Sweden has an Arctic strategy. The U.S. has. Uh, an Arctic strategy. Our different military departments have also released Arctic strategies. Um, as was mentioned, the Air Force uh, most recently did that. Uh, one of our audience questions is how far is the U.S. behind uh, on planning for uh, uh, climate change and, and Arctic to security? Um, and is military leadership making plans that recognize the reality of climate change, notwithstanding the politics surrounding the issue? Uh, so perhaps this is an opportunity to address the fact that our military being apolitical has these strategies and that is separate from perhaps uh, the, the political divisions of government. But if, uh, if, if I may, General, if you could explain that, that separation and how, uh, of course, the military has been a leader in that sense on issues of climate and security for years now with its planning and reporting. So how that fits perhaps into the larger uh, security strategy? Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I, I mean, I think within uh, certainly within the Department of Defense, as, as Sherry's an example of, and 
um, the ambassador uh, in, in some of his roles as, as well. I mean, has, has an infrastructure in place uh, with, you know, with offices, with uh, leadership for people who, who are able to think and understand and, you know, provide guidance in terms of how we do this. So we, we have some well-developed institutional uh, approaches to this that are, that are part, of, uh, part, of our, part of our process. And I think this is a really, really important, uh, really important aspect. Uh, this is where the continuity uh, of thinking and other things really kind of comes into, uh, into play. So it's important to have uh, on the policy side to have that structure in place within our government as we kind of, as we, as we move forward. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I think, um, you know, as, as military commanders looking at, the, at these, uh, at these challenges that we're, we're facing with, you know, I, you know, what, what we're always thinking about is we're thinking about three things. We're thinking about policy, <clears throat> we're thinking about resources, and we're thinking about risk. And, uh, and, um, you know, as, as you think about each of those things, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in, in your respective areas, you're trying to apply that. So yes, I do think, I mean, as you look at, 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 uh, at a, a risk and, and, and how we're going to operate in particular areas, whether it's the Arctic or some other place around here, we have to take into consideration the, the impacts that are, uh, uh, that are happening on the ground. I mean, we see, we see in portions of the Middle East, certainly in Africa, um, you know, we're seeing it uh, playing out here between Egypt and Ethiopia, the, the concerns over water uh, and uh, the impact that that has uh, on how nations look at their own security problems and their own, uh, their own sovereignty. Uh, and this is definitely going to influence uh, how, how planning is. So, I, so that, 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 that plays in there. And, and frankly, I, you know, I know there are some political aspects. There's, I know there are very heavy political aspects to talking about climate change and everything else. I, I, I don't see those playing out as much in the, in the day to day reality of military planning uh, and operating in these particular areas. I think there's a recognition of this. I think our back structures help us to, uh, to preserve that. And, uh, and I think we, I think we have to always, we have to always make sure that that is a, that is a factor in our, in our planning. Yeah. So I agree with General Votel, let me add, you know, I sometimes say in the Arctic, we need to be able, and elsewhere, we need to be able to walk and chew gum. Okay, we, we need to recognize that um, we have real national security interests in, uh, in, in the region and they're changing and there is growing geostrategic competition and much of it is because of climate change. Um, the, the, as the recent strategies um, haven't recognized, have not directly recognized climate change because of political direction from this White House. It's not that, I mean, the preparations and the planning are all, I'd say, you know, are all, all address the security needs as they should by the military departments. Uh, they're just using sort of euphemisms for climate change because of this administration, uh, which is a shame because, um, you know, it's, it's like having your head in the sand. And uh, that is, the, you know, that denial does, does affect uh, you know, leadership at certain levels, not at the, you know, not at the military at the highest level. I think Secretary Mattis was very forthright about it. Uh, but it, it does mean that uh, the, some of those who uh, at the more working and, and mid levels who would probably be more uh, proactive feel the need to be somewhat constrained by their activities or to use other workarounds now. So I, I think it's important to, you know, to be, to use the science, um, to address, do evidence-based planning, which is really what the military is all about, using the facts on the ground, sea, air, wherever they are, and the best data and the best evidence uh, to make realistic assessments and realistic judgments. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, the uh, issue of, of climate change from a wide, uh, impacts from a wider point of view, so not just the Arctic, um, I wonder, is, are there lessons that we can learn from how it's affecting the Arctic to apply to climate change security exists more generally or vice versa. General Votel's also mentioned some examples from non-Arctic places of, of incidents, but um, you know, are there some, is there a particular example of a lesson learned that uh, perhaps we can apply to the Arctic specifically that uh, any of you would like to share? 
whether it be on co coalition building or um, on timing of trying to build that coalition or something else. Mm. Well, perhaps um, we can uh, think of it as um, if, if this is this, well, not if, it is a big and global threat. There is a connection with um, uh, the use of fossil fuels helping to advance um, climate change. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and there are quite a few fossil fuels in the Arctic region. This is one of the opportunities that is pointed to for possible economic development in the region. Um, that there may be, as the ice melts, more opportunities for extract, uh, extraction sector to operate up there. And yet we see a move globally away from the use of fossil fuels. Um, and if I, if I dare may point to Sweden, Sweden has been a leader on this in shifting its energy sector into renewable energy and other things like this. Um, and of course, Sweden also being an Arctic state. So uh, Bjorn, perhaps you can comment on, um, on how that shift to uh, greener energy fits into a larger security uh, plan for, for Sweden or for Europe more generally. Yeah, uh, no, that, that's a very good question. I am not sure. I think, I mean, there are, like I said at some point earlier, there are like, there are all these ways in which climate change, I mean, because it affects the, the whole planet and so many aspects of our lives, uh, it does, of course, have security implications. But I think the Swedish view is really that uh, what we are doing, the kind of measures we're taking to uh, mitigate and hopefully at some point even reverse climate change. Uh, and one of them is, of course, that we have uh, since three years back, Sweden uh, sort of Sweden has a, a policy which is uh, has a very broad support in our parliament, uh, which has the, the as its stated goal that Sweden by 2045 should be the first uh, the first developed country which uh, is is not dependent on fossil fuels or which sort of has ar arrived at, at zero net emissions of greenhouse gases and that's very ambitious and there I like I could spend a lot of time talking about all the money that is being poured into making this uh, reality but I think from our point of view this is really it's worth doing it's like you don't need to sort of bring necessarily to bring security arguments in to argue for why this is a good thing to do. It's a good, it's a good thing to do because it is ultimately about, you know, I guess in some way the future of, of our species and many other species. So I, 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 I mean, I, I don't know that those connections are necessarily made in a very, in a very overt way. Um, and uh, it is more like a supporting argument for doing what we are because of, of course there is uh, a lot being written and analysis being written about all the ways in which uh, a changing climate can wreak havoc in especially in more vulnerable parts as, as the uh, the general was referring to. I, I, I don't know that the Swedish policy here is driven primarily by let's say fears or concerns about what the, the the implications, the security implications of climate change might be in our immediate neighborhood or for ourselves it's it's um it's it's more about you know it's it's the right thing to do. Uh, well, as you know, Sander, many banks and investment houses have have recently announced U.S. that, that they're not going to invest in in um, extraction of um, oil and gas in the American Arctic. So and and not that that was going to happen anytime soon. Shell pulled out five years ago. Oil prices have plummeted. Uh, with the increasing number of net zero um, commitments, um, including by China most recently, uh, at the UN last week, which claimed it's going to be net zero in emissions by 2060, despite building several coal-fired power plants per week. So they've got a long way to go. But nonetheless, we are on, and we are in an energy transition, and the demand signal is beginning to is beginning to decline, especially for expensive oil and gas resource extraction. So. Um, I, I, th I, don't, I think it will still happen in parts of the Arctic, particularly the Russian Arctic, uh, less likely to happen um, in, in the U.S. Arctic. Uh, I, I want to point to, there was one I thought interesting question among, among those. There's many, I'm sorry we can't answer all of them probably uh, now, but the, a questioner did ask about Svalbard, which I think is an interesting 
yes. uh, mention of what General Votel talked about in sort of gray zone. Uh, because Svalbard, uh, while it has a unique uh, legal status, uh, while it's part of Norway, it is, it is sort of a demilitarized zone. It's got, it allows for international research under the Svalbard Treaty. Russia, China, others have research stations there. Russia until recently had a coal station on Svalbard. It's not part of the European Schengen zone. Um, and so, uh, and, and various times, Russia in recent, uh, over the last year has lodged sort of diplomatic protests against Norway uh, for their activities on Norway, claiming sort of exclusion or, or failure to comply with, with provisions of the Svalbard Treaty. Now, all of this, none of this is making sort of New York Times headlines yet, and I don't expect it to, but it's part of a pattern um, that I think we need to pay attention to because why were we blindsided in Ukraine and Crimea? We weren't paying attention to those little green men. And in Svalbard and the Arctic, it's not going to look like little green men. It's going to look different. And we have to be prepared to uh, identify and observe and track these trends that could lead to not conflict is not the right word, but it's disruption um, and uh, a different form of aggression. And we don't yet know what that's going to take, but uh, Svalbard is certainly a place where we need to have our eyes wide open. It's very strategic, has a lot of radar tracking stations across it. It's in a unique play, unique geography, and uniquely close uh, to, to Russia. Um, Say so ditto with Greenland. Um, you know, this is an area where, in particular, China is attempting to make inroads uh, and create influence in, uh, in extraction of uh, critical minerals and uh, tourism uh, and infrastructure and energy uh, here. And uh, I mean, these things seem fairly innocuous uh, to us, but again, it's this idea of a death of a thousand cuts, the impact of a long-term strategy that we are not paying attention to checking where appropriate and and then and then making sure that we preserve our own interests in the long term as, as well so I, I think you know it, in my view I think that's uh, that's kind of how to, I've been thinking a lot about your question a little bit earlier you know so what role does the military play in doing some of this it probably is not a direct role particularly when it comes to the uh, to the um, uh, you know to protecting you know you know controlling climate change and and, and, and addressing that trend. but one of the things we do do is our is by our presence, by, uh, by the infrastructure that is in place, by uh, the ability to exercise and operate in areas, we exert our own influence. We exert a national influence and the influence of our, of our partners that are with us. And that, I think, directly supports economic, informational, diplomatic efforts uh, that, uh, that, that, that can get after this. Again, it's, I think it's about the comprehensive approach and you know, it's a recognition that uh, while you may not be doing something directly to address the problem, the supporting effort to it is very, 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 very important. Um, and and this this idea of the supporting the supporting effort and the coordination there, I think, connects with with one of the questions that we see in the chat. And I want to remind everybody that the Q and A function at the bottom is where you can ask questions. Please continue to have those roll in. Um, uh, there's a question that you know, in addition to Sweden. Is it possible that, that other allies like Canada, Finland, European Union, or another non-NATO state with which the U.S. has close relations could create some form of joint offering um, for security? I guess that uh, maybe the implication here being uh, to, to counter China influence or Russian influence. And I think we talked a bit about this, but um, to take this question one step further, it, it is in looking to build cooperation, is it helpful to have this parsing of alliances or um, it, 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 to combat the great power competition? Or do we need to embrace China and, and Russia into these sorts of coalitions and dialogues now? Well, Look, I can't make, oh, go ahead, General. I was just gonna say, I, I think the, the inherent advantage the United States has, we have a lot of people who want to, who want to you know, I'm speaking from a U.S. perspective here, uh, is that we have a lot of people who do want to partner with us. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's always important that when we look at our list of 
partners and allies and friends is always longer than Russia's or China's. And I think that's an important place to be. So to the question here, to Kevin's question, um, yeah, I think there, I think there certainly are opportunities for this. We, we see this in a variety of different reasons. Some of the more effective uh, measures that we've seen in places like the Arabian Gulf have been uh, multinational approaches that we've taken to things like piracy, uh, to securing shorelines, doing things like that, uh, that, can, that bring together a variety of different partners, um, some, you know, as, 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 as deep as NATO allies, uh, because they share interests in this area. So I do think there are, uh, there are opportunities to, you know, create a form of, uh, you know, some kind of form of a, an alliance here to, to address our address our interests in this area. Um, there are a couple of questions uh, that have been asked regarding the use of an exclusive economic zone. So for those who are unfamiliar, uh, this term as, as uh, described in, in UNCLOSE has to do with the amount of territorial sea in which a sovereign state can exploit the resources. Um, and uh, there is a part of the Arctic that lies outside of these EEZs of any Arctic state. Um, and so one of the questions here is how do Arctic states legally try to limit uh, perhaps fishing or other uses of that open area um, from non-Arctic states? The particular example side in this question is China. And then there's another question here, can the speakers address Russia's denial of free navigation along northeastern Arctic Sea route uh, because that route is in Russia's um, EEZ? So, what are some possible ways in which Arctic nations can respond or address uh, the, these issues of EEZ violation or having some control over a part of the sea that does not lie uh, within anyone's EEZ? Uh, who would like to take that? Uh, well, Bjorn? this is part of the reason we have to. I, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sherry. And then uh, Bjorn, because he has not. Part of the reason we need to improve our domain awareness in the region is, is we don't know. We, we don't know where, uh, what's up there much of the time. And if you take a snapshot on any particular day off the coast of Alaska, as, as the Coast Guard sometimes does, you see more foreign vessels than American vessels um, in, during the summer. So uh, we, we need. We need to increase our domain awareness in a variety of ways um, to understand what vessels are up there. That's true across, you know, it's not only an issue in the Arctic, it's more challenging in the, in the Arctic because communications above certain, uh, uh, above, uh, certain degrees high north is, becomes even more complicated. But uh, it's also true that in vast parts of the South Pacific, we don't know what vessels are out there, and what that's why we have we have trouble tracking illegal fishing, uh, as General Votel noted. So uh, I, I think that's we, we need to improve that capability. Um, you know, the and Dave, I'm sure Ambassador Bolton is going to talk about the Central uh, Arctic uh, Fishing Moratorium, which he helped negotiate for the U.S., which does create a moratorium on fishing in the Central Arctic region, uh, but allows the nations that are party to it, including China, over the next 16 years to conduct research and observations. Uh, and that is sort of is, um, it preserves the moratorium, but creates that opportunity that when there's a viable fishery in the future, the parties to the agreement will already know more about what their opportunities could be uh, to pursue that. So uh, I, th I think it's going to be important to develop some kind of rules of, of the road and increase domain awareness in the future. And I also think let's be careful not to conflate Russia and China in the Arctic. They're very different. I mean, Russia has the longest Arctic coastline. It is, it's a status quo Arctic nation. You can't do anything in the Arctic without engaging Russia. China is not an Arctic nation. China has Arctic ambitions uh, and seeks economic interests and advantage, potentially further than that even, but it's not an Arctic nation. And so when we think about those constructs, we need to, to recognize that. Bjorn, would you like to comment? Yeah, thank you. No, yeah, being neither neither an international lawyer nor a fisheries expert, I, I wouldn't sort of wade too deep into the the, the EEZs and then the the fishery um, 
I think, I mean, I come, coming back to a previous point or sort of a really uh, line of thought, which is that um, the Arctic is in, 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 in many important ways unique, but it is also not unique. And, and you know, if it has, given that, it, given what, is, what it has been possible to achieve in terms of regulation of, of these things in, in other parts of the world, um, and other global problems, it, it should be. I mean, our ambition has to be uh, to, 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 to be able to do the same thing in Arctic. And, and finally, just to reinforce Sherry's point about, yes, Russia and China are uh, not the same. They, they, that is an important distinction to make. Uh, and uh, Russia, as you said, is, it, is, uh, it is a key, it is an Arctic uh, country. It is a, a key player and it is um, uh, in the Arctic Council uh, it is playing a uh, mostly um, constructive role. So that, that is an important distinction, which we shouldn't be lost, even though there are similarities in, in other uh, domains uh, when it comes to how these countries operate. Thank you. Well, we have just a few moments left. So I would like to give each of our panelists an opportunity for the closing thought that they want to uh, leave our audience today with. Um, uh, also, for those who did not get the second CLE code, it is zebra, uh, and I repeat, the second CLE code is zebra. Uh, with that, um, I'm going to start uh, with General Fotel. Um, brief final thought uh, to, to leave us parting with today. Our uh, our greatest security accomplishments uh, from a United States standpoint have always been accomplished through uh, through alliances and through working with our partners. And I would suggest that the challenges that we're facing in the Arctic are going to be solved the same way, are going to be addressed the same way, if not solved. They're going to be addressed the same way. And so we have, we can't, uh, this can't be a go it alone approach. We have to operate with our partners uh, just as we've done successfully in many, many different uh, examples in the past. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Goodman. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I'll, fo I'll foot stomp what uh, General Votel said about the importance of allies and partners and about also the experience that M Ambassador uh, Fagerberg referred to, you know, his experience with the OSCE and other um, institutions which uh, throughout the Cold War played an important, if not low key role in um, managing relations, even dur during periods of high tension uh, between the US and Russia and other powers. So I think it's important to keep in mind that even in eras where tensions is growing, tensions are growing among strategic competitors, it is possible to design constructs that manage that competition and that reduce certain levels of risk, certain levels of risk. Uh, and that's where I think you as lawyers or law students play an important role. And I would urge you to go back and look at some of these agreements, the OSCE, the Incident at Sea Agreement, the Open Skies Agreement, um, activities of dangerous military, um, uh, dangerous military activities agreement. Many of them are, are referenced in this report which you can find on state.gov, International Security Advisory Board on Arctic Activities. I was the vice chair of that a couple of, year, couple of years ago. There's also a Council on Foreign Relations Arctic Task Force. Uh, and there's probably some other articles out there that uh, I think would be useful if you're going to write a law paper or a law review article. I mean, I think there's some very useful ground worth um, exploring here. Uh, as a way to sort of revitalize or extend some of these agreements, bring in potentially new partners, set some new roles, potentially starting through a track to dialogue and eventually enabling um, more fulsome discussion among governments at the appropriate time. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Fagerberg. No, th those were... Off. <laughs> Thank you. Those were, I, 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 I agree with absolutely everything. I think in a way you could maybe summarize them under the headings like there is no need to reinvent the wheel, right? You have, you, you have alliances, uh, work with them, uh, engage with them. Uh, also, you have a, lo a lot of uh, uh, a lot of stuff that was that was achieved uh, during the Cold War, and a lot of that, and especially the methods through which it was achieved, uh, are still I, I am convinced are still viable. Uh, and maybe yeah, just finally to say that uh, you know the message the Swedish 
Swedish message to the U.S. is to, uh, it's, it's taken us a while to start really thinking of ourselves as an Arctic state. I'm not sure. I, I have a feeling that maybe it's a little bit like that in the U.S. as well, that, you know, maybe uh, certain other countries in, in the Arctic sort of have this more, it's more part of their persona or their identity, but uh, uh, we, we need you. Uh, we need the, the, the U.S. in the Arctic. Uh, we need you to be engaged uh, in, in a wide, I mean, in the security field, for sure, that is, and I've I've, uh, I've I've spoken about that, but also in other in all the other fields, and of course, uh, uh, if the U.S. at a political level could uh, could uh, talk about climate change as the challenge that it is, uh, without limitations, that that would be uh, that would be welcomed uh, by everyone else. So, um, um, yeah, but we, lo looking forward to work more with you in the Arctic. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, uh, thank all of our panelists for joining us today. We really appreciate your time uh, and insight into these issues. I also want to thank all of our viewers today and participants, as I said, for spending your lunch hour with us. Uh, our next uh, public session will be at three o'clock to talk about communications. Uh, again, for those who missed the second CLE code, it is Zebra. Uh, they are not found in the Arctic, but that is our code for today, is Zebra. Uh, and with that, again, thank you very, very much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again at a future Seoul APPC or Wilson event. Thank you. Thank you, Xander. Nicely done. Bye, all. Mm -hmm.